Good afternoon, everyone. We are delighted to have you here with us this afternoon. My name is Patrick Garrigan. I'm executive director at Atlantic Live, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's uh, conversation about cities and tech here at City Lab 2019. As you all know, cities are on the cutting edge of technology. They are laboratories for mobility solutions, as you'll hear later today, the birthplace of new apps that make everything more convenient, and the home of robotic delivery vehicles that bring everything from lunch to laptops to our front doors. But the technology that fuels these cities also brings risk. The surge in data collection and cameras for security challenges our privacy and cities themselves, as many of them have become victims of cybercrime. Some have been the targets of hackers who threaten to shut down city services over demands for large sums of money. We are gonna dive into all of these issues and so much more today, including a look at new technology that could fuel all of these city innovations and make our city life move so much faster. Before we dive in, I wanna thank General Motors for making all of City Lab and particularly this session possible. For that, please join me in welcoming Jeff Massimilla, General Motors Vice President of Global Cybersecurity for Brief Remarks. Great, thank you, Patrick, and hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jeff Massimilla. I feel like I have a, a light coming out of my head here. Sorry about that. Um, I'm Jeff Massimilla. I, I'm a, I, the Vice President of Global Cybersecurity for the company, um, having responsibility for many aspects or multiple aspects of cyber for the company. But first of all, I'm really excited to be here today, and I thank you all for the opportunity. Um, this is a great topic, right? This is a great topic with a bunch of people in the room who play a really important role in cities. Cities are a huge part of critical infrastructure. They collect a lot of data. They, you know, they have a lot of services that are required for their, their constituents. And most of all, they're becoming more connected. And I'm gonna leave that with a pin in it for a second and come back to that at the end. Um, at General Motors, we take safety and privacy of our customers to our highest level of importance. Cybersecurity is really foundational to that. Um, we have a vision of zero crashes, zero emissions, and zero congestion. And when I talk about that vision, cybersecurity is a pillar to that vision. Um, that takes great technology for us to be able to, to, to realize that vision, and for that great technology to be in the vehicle and for us to be confident for our customers, it has to have a great cybersecurity foundation. Uh, cybersecurity is um, it, it's, it's at the highest levels of our company, so from our CEO, to our board of directors, a dedicated committee of our board of directors down into our organization. It is a, it, it's one of the most highest priorities for us. And I think that's truly what it takes. It takes it from the top to enable it. We're a well-funded, well-organized, we get the resources we need, and that's the only way that we have a chance of being successful um, in this space. Also, collaborations are really important. We collaborate significantly within and outside of our industry. I consider this a collaboration today with people that I've never had a chance to speak with. So um, that's why I'm excited to be here. So like back to smart cities for one more second. Um, we had our ISAC board meeting. ISAC, not my ISAC, but the ISAC. Um, the Intel, er, um, uh, the um, boy, now I'm, in Intelligence Sharing and Information Center. Um, set up under DHS. Um, I'm the chair of that organization, delighted to, to serve as the chair of that organization. We had our meeting last week, and I can't talk about the specifics of the meeting, but I can say smart cities came up in that meeting, and that's why I was so excited to be here today, because when we talk about autonomous vehicles and the infrastructure that cities will put in place, our ecosystem is already big. It's going to get that much bigger. And so when I talk about collaborations and why I'm happy to be here, um, all of you in this room, I would love a chance to collaborate and for the, the collaboration on us going forward to protect all of us from a safety and privacy perspective. So I really look forward to the panel today and thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Jeff. A quick housekeeping note, please take a quick moment to silence your cell phones, but don't put them away. We'd love for you to participate in the conversation online. We're on Twitter using the hashtag CityLabDC. Again, that's hashtag CityLabDC. And now, a conversation about the growing risk cities face in cyber attacks and ransomware. For Cities Held Hostage, please join me in welcoming Wendy Whitmore. She is Vice President at IBM's X-Force Threat Intelligence. Welcome, Wendy. 
And Gary Brantley, he's the Chief Information Officer for the City of Atlanta. Leading the conversation, please welcome journalist Jean Masur. Jean? Thank you all for being here, and thank you for being here. Wendy, I think they should make a movie about you. IBM, X-Force, Threat Intelligence. Does it sound like that a sound superhero exciting, right? thing? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Gary, I want to start with you, because what we're talking about here is, is essentially digital extortion. We're talking about hackers who get into city systems, hold their data hostage until a ransom is paid. Some people pay the ransom, some people don't. Atlanta opted not to. Tell us what happened in Atlanta, the Cliff Notes version. Yeah, so um, I don't have a cool title. Um, like, <laughs> like, so I, you know, but you're I, a cool guy, that. so I, that... I, I tried to, the, to get the socks to, to, to <laughs> situate that. But, um, you know, just a, just a little bit about what happened with the city of Atlanta. Um, of course, no one wants to get that call. Fortunately, I wasn't the one that actually got the call. Um, you know, I came in after... To, to really, you know, fix things. But, you know, in, in, in retrospect and looking back, there are, um, you know, I've gotten that, that call before. And so um, it's, a, it's a really hard thing to explain to an entire organization um, that really hasn't had a, a lot of practice uh, from, from a cyber attack. And so, um, you know, the first thing people want to say is that they want to look at you and they want to say it's incompetence in the IT department really negating the fact that this is a crime, period, uh, point blank. And so, um, you know, that's the first thing that needs to be established. But you also have to have a leadership like we have with uh, a Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms who said, I'm not going to pay. I'm not going to pay a dime. What was the impact on city services? It, it was a huge impact. You know, you, 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 lose, you lose the ability to work efficiently across the board. And, you know, I said this last week, it didn't remove you from your obligation, which is if you got a ticket, you had to pay the ticket. If it, you, know, um, you, you know, so revenue, from the standpoint of revenue, you didn't, you didn't really lose that much. Um, you know, if you, if you had court costs, fines, or whatever, you still had to pay that. But I think the, the, the biggest piece is you really lose your ability from an operational efficiency standpoint. Why did Atlanta decide not to pay the ransom? I think, you know, n number one is, is best practice, but number two, I don't think our, our city and our mayor agree with paying criminals. But how much did it cost you to get the systems back online? It was a lot more <laughs> than the ransom would have been. It, it, it was a lot more, but what we have to have to realize is that there are things that that you have to have in place to to really build your security posture and so what we decided to do was focus on the things that we needed going forward from a system perspective then to spend money to pay or to pay a criminal who had keys and, and didn't know if there was a back door in place or you know all of those different so we focused on future state and we'll get to that but yeah. wendy was this the right thing to do to say no 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 we're not going to pay yeah, I actually love hearing Gary's response here. So I, um, you know, a little bit about my background, right? I've been responding to data breaches for almost two decades, many of them being the biggest breaches we've seen in the world. And there's this interesting thing about ransomware that people have this perception it might be different. And that's often because the victim feels like, well, maybe I have a choice in response, right? Maybe I have the ability to pay the ransom. And then ultimately, I don't need to actually deal with the root of the security problem. And the reality is that's such a common misperception uh, because if you do choose to pay the ransom, that's kind of part one of a very long, lengthy, multi-part step, right? And you ultimately still have to pay, um, have to actually secure the environment, right? So to close or the gaps that allowed it to occur. a second time or a third time. Well, or someone else does in the future, right? But ultimately, there's no way to get around the, the reality that you've got to fix the situation and fix the problem, close the security gaps that occurred right, to enable that ransomware attack to occur in the first place. Why are cities such attractive targets? Yeah, they, I mean, I'm sure Gary could answer that at length, right? Um, right, but you know, when we look at, I mean, there's so many factors of it that create this really large attack surface with cities, and that's because the distributed nature of their environment, you have a police department, a fire department, a financial controller's office, oftentimes all on separate networks, separate technologies, operating systems, very hard to have the right visibility into defending and detecting the attacks. And then you have ultimately the, the lack of funding, right, that goes to cities. So um, a unique 
unique stat is over 50% of states in the US don't even have a cybersecurity line item in their budget. And that certainly trickles down to cities. So you've got this whole skills gap within the industry where we have over a million job shortage today. And then ultimately training, uh, you know, att uh, attracting and then retaining that talent once they've got experience is extremely hard to do in such a competitive market. What do you think there? Uh, I mean, I agree with everything that she said. You know, when you look at the, the, con the conflicting interests across the board, the limited amount of funds that are available, you know, it's not, it's not until something happens like this that everybody really gets serious about what that priority should be. Do cities even have the capability to detect an attack early? Yeah, I mean, so, so, some so, do. So right. let me answer that, <laughs> at least for the city, right, of Atlanta, right? Um, uh, yes, absolutely. Now or then? No, I think then too. I think that um, I think that's one of the the biggest areas. I had this saying in in coming into this, and in, in a lot of situations where we have to get back to basics, right? Fundamental basics of how we operate, and I think a lot of times we lose sight of that. It's this real flashy thing out here called smart cities, right? Everyone loves it. Glitter, glam, right? But there's also the operational aspect that we cannot forget about that, uh, that, that drives the organization to success every single day. Touching on smart cities, does that expand the risk? Because the surface area. Well, you continue to yeah, have an increased surface area that you're responsible for the visibility of detecting. Um, and while I agree that I think it's a goal with Gary, that it's a goal that everyone can get to the capability of detecting, I don't think that's a reality today. And not just in cities, but certainly in many technical, uh, you know, private organizations who have a lot of funding, right? Attacks are coming at such a high volume and frequency that having the visibility to detect across a wide variety of platforms is difficult, right? On the city side, I think there are some cities who are doing some tremendous work. We're all aware now that these are that these types of attacks are a problem, but like the city of Los Angeles, for example, just created this online uh, threat information sharing portal that allows private citizens as well as companies and parts of the government to all share information, right, On a, from a threat sharing perspective. Why is that important? That's important so that we can get to your, your, the answer to your question, right? How do we detect these attacks? Well, we've got to have data sets and we've got to have visibility into the systems with which they are occurring. And then I think to Gary's point, you've got to empower your people to make good decisions and know that they've got the support of their leadership because these are ultimately crisis situations. This is not just about technology. So, so I, I want to go back. I I agree with everything Wendy's saying, but the other side of it is, I think we do have the ability to identify. I think we talk about talent, but let's look at staff augmentation. It's organizations like IBM, it's organizations out there, and I'm only dropping a dime because you're sitting here. I don't like to plug companies, but at, 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 you know. At, Thank you. At, I appreciate that. You know, at the same time, when you, you, you really start to look at staff augmentation, you really start to look at having a security strategy at the front of your implementations instead of at the end. And I think you do get to a place where you can identify. Remember, there's these frameworks, and we follow a NIST framework, right, uh, by DHS. And that's what we're looking at. You know, my goal is, you know, how quickly can we identify? How, how quickly can we detect? Right? How quickly can we respond and recover? And I know Wendy knows, knows these things. But when you shoot for a goal and you are intentional about that, about that goal, we are extreme. I don't want to hear anything about smart cities right now. I know I have to have a balance, but I'm extremely intentional about getting the city to that place. And so I do think it, it is attainable. The talent question is a huge one, though. Cities don't pay what the private industry does. Even private industry can't find the talent they need. Can, you, can cities recruit the people they need? I, 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 yes, I, I think so. I have a... How? And I was just saying, you know what? I think it's a mixture of really, and we talked about this earlier. I know it, it kind of sounds like a, a saying, but you really have to sell a mission and a goal, and you have to find like-minded people. I'm, I'm with the city because of that. Um, you know, I've been in many of these situations, and so, you know, I got a, a, a CTO from Lockheed. I said before, I got a CISO from Travelport. Uh, who, they were making tons and tons of money, but I believe that we all have one shared vision around really going in and fixing these things for our city. So I think you, gotta sell, you, you can sell it. I do. 
I think there's another interesting element to this as well, and that um, it's not just about the cities and the resources they have, but we recently did a study of taxpayers, right? So thousands of taxpayers across the board, and what were their thoughts on paying ransoms? So wholeheartedly, um, you know, the majority agrees that, hey, we don't want our taxpayer funds going to paying ransoms. But one thing that came about was, hey, you know, we have federal government support for other types of crisis situations, you know, natural emergencies, you have FEMA coming into support. Why do we not potentially have a force that cities could also leverage from the federal government that may be a specialty force um, that supplements, right? And also kind of a, a group of responders like the police, like firemen, who go out and actually respond to crisis situations. I think that there's going to be, um, you know, some movement towards that in the future. And I think that in particular, these attacks are drawing enough attention that we may see some different actions there. Well, the Department of Homeland Security does have a cybersecurity infrastructure and security agency. Have they been useful to you? They, they've been very useful, but I, I, you know, I also think that that we're forgetting the, the one thing. We're we're not here to necessarily stop the attacks. We're here to be prepared, and I prepare for the inevitable. And so I look at these things as uh, almost in the same way I look at natural disasters. And one of the things, you know, I spent a lot of time in a school system, and one of the things, and I that I was really impressed with was when when there's a disaster situation, those kids know exactly what to do. You want to know why? Because they develop muscle memory, and it's the same thing around the army and those tactical fights right you have to prepare you have to prepare and you have to keep going and rehearsing oh you don't want to look at your playbook on day one so it's less about the attack for me and more about your ability to respond when it happens isn't part of it you talk about the need for education and preparedness a lot of these attacks occur for really simple reasons employees click on an email and open a phishing email and introduce the ransomware into the system, right? That, that is that is one way, yes. <laughs> well, so we've been hearing about that for a dozen years. Why is that still happening? Are cities well, not paying attention to the need to educate everybody up and down the food chain to the danger of this. Yeah, Gene, the reality is that happens in organizations across the board. So opening what we would call a spear phishing email is over 60% of the primary attack factor in every type of attack that occurs, right? So getting to how do we defend against it, it's exactly what Gary said. We expect that it's going to happen because even if I'm a financial services industry and I have 10,000 people on my security team, some employee is still going to open one of those emails. So what can you do to be effective about these attacks? First and foremost is you actually train and you prepare for them, you understand and develop the capability to know how do I get a hold of my employees in the event my systems go offline? How do I effectively engage in getting data? Do we have maybe a secondary communication mechanism set up, right, if our whole email infrastructure goes down? Next, you have on your sensitive data, do you have backups of it that are offline? Because we see often in these ransomware attacks, there are backups, but if they're connected to the network at all times, they also get corrupted. So those are some important things, but first and foremost, it goes back to the rehearsing. Um, if I were going to run a marathon, I wouldn't start training for it today if it's on Saturday, right? Same thing with these. These are exercises that we can train and develop uh, muscle memory and empower people in every successful response, which there are many of them, right? We hear about the ones in the news that are, you know, these catastrophic events. These attacks go on every day and many organizations work to defend against them very successfully. What they do is prepare for them. They're um, anticipating the scenarios and they're continually training their employees and all also identifying, hey, we didn't respond so well in this exercise, so let's close this gap. Do you have any other thoughts on what cities can do? No, no, I, I agree. I think, um, you know, your preparation for these things, of course, you want to be able to identify them quickly. You don't want bad actors in your system for over a year deleting all your stuff. But one, one key thing, and the city of Atlanta has been working on this, uh, you know, since I arrived, which is business continuity and disaster recovery, right? Business con, you know, what do we do in these situations? How can we continue to keep upgrading those documents and, and those procedures? And then how are we putting or, or designing uh, disaster recovery, uh, you know, systems operations around our continuity plan and so you know we hear it all the time they say resiliency right resilience that's that's what we're working on uh, you know to ensure we're not brought to our knees like we were before you agree 
Absolutely. I think the reality is what we communicate to our clients is limiting the impact, right? So breaches are going to occur. They're doing it on a daily basis. But if you can limit the impact, then you have a win. You save money. And in this case, you may save actual human lives. It sounds like a lot of work. Sounds like a lot of money. A lot of the cities and towns that are being hit are small. They don't have the resources of an Atlanta. What can they do? You know, the, I think the biggest thing, and we're starting to do that, we did that around the Super Bowl, is, uh, you know, leveraging our, our federal partners, our private business. Is you know everyone lives in this in this in the city, and you have major resources in the city that you can use both internally and externally. In a big city, but what about a smaller town? Well, I think it, to Gary's point, it goes to leveraging your resources, right? Which is this mu much bigger ecosystem of partners of other providers. Um, one thing we're doing is offering free training in our. Uh, we have in Boston a really state of the art facility that where you can do cyber simulations, right? So we train a lot of paid clients. We're also offering that training free to cities specific to actual ransomware attacks, right? So can we run through? Have you go through these type of this type of event? You understand what are going to be the different steps that you would need to be prepared for to do it. And I think the industry is really looking to develop more of those offerings so that we can help organizations prevent these problems. And let's go Let's go back to small cities too. I, I believe they have a, a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of resources that they can leverage, including bigger cities. Um, you know, we, the, the one thing I will say is bad actors are a lot more organized than, than uh, city individuals and, and those on the other side. And, and you also have to remember the talent on that side is extremely, it's it's it, it's great, um, and so we have a bigger issue that we have to look at. But you know, from leveraging, being able to leverage businesses and and also other cities, and all, you know, we need to we need to get stronger from a collabor collaborative perspective on that. Why not just buy insurance? The insurance companies will pay the big part of the bill, won't they? If they need to pay ransom. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I you know they pay, but at, at the end of the day, they're getting smarter as well too. So they they want to see, you know, um, and, and and we're going through a renewal right now. They want to see that you have certain things in place, and day by day, you know, they want more control. They want more insight, and, and in some cases, control of, of what you're doing from a cybersecurity standpoint. Okay, so they're actually a lever for change in this instance. Absolutely, absolutely, you want that there. Um, I think as I, you know, I think they're a lot smarter than they've been. The last last few years and so you know you're going to see that industry change as well um, how much do you tell the public in a situation like that how much should the public know for instance if your public safety systems are down do you let people know that or not I think you do yeah you, I, I think you have to I think awareness is key uh, I, I think there are certain things as it relates to to your infrastructure and of course there are rules around data privacy so you have to make sure you follow those as well but I think being as transparent as possible in these situations is 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 what I would feel that is the thing that we should we should did Atlanta do that did Atlanta spell out to the citizens of the city what was going on and, I, and how services were impacted that I, they couldn't get Wi-Fi at the airport <laughs> no but we could get Wi-Fi at the airport uh, <laughs> the airport was fine all right I just want to let you, you know that down Wi -Fi for a while, didn't they? No, not not because of that no but um <laughs> <laughs> no the, the airport was great uh, the, the uh, most efficient airport in the world but that anyway <laughs> that would get people more upset than any other city service going down. Probably. That is that is correct, but but no, um, you know, I think I think you're, you know, to your question, I think you become extremely transparent in these situations as much as you can tell without jeopardizing, uh, you know, public safety. I think is something that you should really look at. So I agree. Transparency is absolutely key, especially when you've got you're talking to citizens, right? The challenge, though, and I think the challenge that Atlanta had particularly was that oftentimes, um, you know, these statements need to be pretty well crafted, right? So you're sharing information, but you're not sharing so much. Um, before you have the answers. Because oftentimes when we're doing these investigations, you know bits and pieces of the information, more comes out by the hour over the course of days. And so we really work to train our clients that, hey, we're only going to provide what we know. You don't want to provide so much that it's misinformation that you then have to go back later, correct information that was provided. And then I think on the city side, when you're dealing with consumers and taxpayers, you have to be very cautious about not um, inciting fear, right? So the, the one of the press conferences, it's 
been, you know, kind of largely um, played was, you know, check all your bank accounts, right, from the from the city of Atlanta. And some other things that occurred that weren't really, you know, the reality was the private taxpayer's information wasn't being stolen in that, um, you know, in that compromise. And then there wasn't kind of the need to go back afterwards and scare the public more. So that's something that I think we had new do continued education on, right? Um, continued, how do we communicate? And those are all things that we can train for and prepare in advance of an attack so that we're not caught off guard. That's the worst time to do to do that. No, I agree. And you also have to remember the things that you're saying are also being heard by, by those who may not have so good intentions as it relates to even your recovery efforts. So you have to be extremely mindful um, and, and having a great communications team, staff and lawyers are key to allowing um, individuals like me to put their head down and really focus on the, the, the areas that we need to from a security perspective. We're going to be taking your questions in just a moment. There are a couple of microphones uh, that will get to you, so be thinking what you want to ask. Let me ask, have we been uh, lucky in a way? As far as I know, none of these attacks have resulted in a loss of life, have they? It, not to my knowledge. So we have had things like 911 dispatch, um, you know, police dispatch systems be impacted. So that's something that we're really critically concerned about with these type of attacks is making sure that the actual human element of it is something that we can prepare for in advance. Man, yes, we have been. I, I really believe we have been lucky. Um, you know, and, and, you know, in some cases, luck plays a, a big part in this. You know, I hear people say we haven't been attacked or, and they kind of attribute it to their po security posture. But in some cases, you've just been lucky. Um, and, and, and in some cases, you just were better than the bad. So, you know, I always, uh, I, you know, luck has played, in my opinion, you know, a, a piece to this. And, and so we have to continue to, to, to as we move forward, to really collaborate and hone in on things we need to do as best practices. How worried are you about election interference? Elections are run at the state and local level. <laughs> it, it, I, I'm very worried. And I think that, um, and I think that those individuals who are in my job who have to, you know, um, service these types of things are extremely worried. Uh, and so it's just something that we have to have to really keep our, keep our eye on. Yeah, I think 2020 is certainly going to be an interesting year. But when you look at the attack surface on the election side, right, it's wide and it's broad. And you have voting systems that are maintained by, by private companies that are then, you know, reporting in. So there's just a really large data set that needs to be protected. And it's not just about maybe changing the results, but it's also, I think, about just creating enough chaos or uncertainty in the validity of those results. And that's something that I think we're all concerned about. Right. And I also think you have to be careful of the narrative creation, too, um, from the use of technology and breaches and really being able to invade spaces. You know, you have these social media platforms. You you know, it's real huge right now with, with what's going on with Facebook. It's, it's, it's less about the actual voting machines and more about their ability to get to the voters to create certain narratives. Um, and so we have to watch that as well. Um, questions out here in the audience? Raise your hand. Oh, we have a couple right here in the front. Hi, I'm Kathy Sheehan. I'm the mayor of the city of Albany. We were subject to a ransomware attack in April, um, and we were able to catch it very early on a Saturday morning, and we were open for business by noon on Monday, um, with only the loss of um, uh, the ability to get birth certificates and death certificates, which you could get from the state. Um, that gloss is over, as you know, <laughs> um, the hundreds of thousands and, you know, racking up to millions of dollars that we're spending rebuilding systems, figuring out where to get that data. So I guess what my question is, and, and I'm pushing back a little bit, is on this talent pool piece. Um, were it not for our partners in state government and we're the state capital being able to literally send bodies over to check PCs that have been compromised and to really work closely with our staff, I don't know how we would have gotten out of it. And that is my biggest concern as I look at building um, a team that is going to be able to be ready for the inevitable of that next attack um, and, and having that skill set. Um, you know, you talked a little bit about training, but, you know, is there a certificate program? What level of education does somebody need? How can we be creating this workforce? Because 
you know, we have challenges with the people who click on those phishing attack, you know, the emails that we're trying to train, but we're really struggling to find people who are ready to build that muscle memory and, and be there um, and be able to respond to these attacks. And it's, you know, maybe in Atlanta it's a better situation, but I got to tell you, it's really, really challenging where we are to find people. So, so you know, to, to answer that, and, and the one thing I always like to say is cybersecurity is everybody's problem, right? It's just not the ITT problem. And so, you know, as you start to move forward, you, you're right, but there are also some things that we can do internally from an organization to eliminate waste. Um, some of the things that I find when you really start to dig into IT organizations, especially in government, is you find a lot of, of, of people who are there who maybe shouldn't be. So what you have to do is you have to streamline, you have to become a lot more efficient, and, and, and once that happens, then you start to staff augment. So my thing is, you know, I'll run extremely lean as long as I have real talented people, and if that means cutting some others to pay people more and getting rid of the waste. Um, I, you know, I, I do believe you, in walking into situations when you start to look at that. And the other thing that we have to be mindful of too, it's not always the talent. Sometimes it's the culture. And so when you look at the culture of what you have and you monitor and you measure what's in place, a lot of times you really start to find that this person is talented, but they weren't working. And so, you know, you gotta keep, and that's why I talked a little bit about smart city. Sometimes we, our focus has shifted. We're not monitoring, we're not measuring. Um, and, and, and I found that we like to blame it on the lack of talent a lot, but sometimes, it, it really comes down to leadership at a high level and, and, f and focus of priorities. We have another question right here. One more here first. Oh, I guess we're gonna go back there first. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Julia Richmond, Chief Innovation and Technology Officer for the City of Boulder. Um, I wonder if you can speak a little bit to the paradigm about cyber insurance and um, the role of cities in maybe influencing insurers to not pay ransoms on our behalf outside of our desires. I know a lot of the large insurance companies can settle a claim whether a city wants to or not um, and sort of wonder what our role is in, in changing that paradigm and, and kind of moving away from that moral hazard. Thoughts? You want, you want me to answer? I'll answer. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was trying to give you the more complicated questions, but at the end of the day, you know what, I, I, think, um, I think insurance companies play a huge role in it. You know, um, we're, we're going through a, a renewal right now. And so some of the, and this is, this is kind of what I said earlier, some of the questions that they asked previously, they're not asking those questions anymore. They, they are getting a lot smarter. They are not just there to pay a claim, I feel like, anymore. Um, you know, I do feel like we got lucky. We, we, we got it just in time. Um, but when you really look at what they're allowing to go through as it relates to a policy, um, they're tightening up. So you think there'll be less ransom paid by the insurance companies? Uh, I, I think the expectation will be greater on the, on the city or entity to, to really be able to show that they've done the basic things they needed to do in order for that policy to be paid. Let's squeeze in one more question if we can. Did we already lose our mic? <laughs> quick, quick. She's running, it's right, oh, okay. there we go. Good afternoon, Andre Saya, Mayor of the City of Patterson. I'm sure all cities are gearing up for the census count next year. Mm. And one potential obstacle is that people don't want to share their information because it's very sensitive and they feel like it can be compromised and used against them. Are there safeguards in place to prevent that from happening as far as the census count is concerned? As, as long as people are involved, I don't think anything is safe. <laughs> I, that's just, you know, um, I, and I, not, not to say that, in a, I just think that, um, you know, it's, it's really never the technology at all. It's, it's really the people who are running it, the people who are, are, are managing it. And so I think that um, I think we have to do a better job of, of I think we can minimize the risk. I, that's what I say. I think we can really minimize it if we really pay attention and we're really focused on that area. Gary, Wendy, thank you both so much. Thank Appreciate you. your being here. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, to discuss the future of 5G in cities, please welcome Shireen Santosham, Chief Information Officer for the City of San Jose. Joining her on stage is author and journalist John Donvin.
Thanks, everybody. Uh, hi, Shereen. Hello. Um, so your title, you represent the city of San Jose, California, which is relevant for a couple of reasons we'll be talking about. Your title is Chief Innovation Officer, right? Which sounds incredibly uh, aspirational. And also, it's a job that didn't exist 10 years ago, maybe five years ago. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm curious, to, to the degree to which you're kind of figuring it out as you go along, what the job actually means, what's your, what, what are your aspirations for this position? Well, I think there's a, about 100 of us in this room, and two-thirds of us don't have job descriptions, is what we learned at the Innovator Studio um, yesterday. So, uh, you know, being a chief innovation officer in Silicon Valley is really um, trying to be as innovative as the community in which we live. So how do we engage with our tech community? How do we use tech tools to better service our residents? Um, and really balancing sort of the pace of technology innovation with um, what's good for people and our residents. So ultimately, you feel that your responsibility is to the residents of San Jose primarily? Absolutely. And you also said at a certain point not too long ago, last year, after serving on an FCC panel that was working, supposedly working towards um, some of the goals that you would have as the Chief Innovation Officer of San Jose, you resigned and you said that the FCC has sold us out. What went wrong there? And then we'll talk about how to make it right. As many of you know, Mayor LeCarter was appointed to an FCC advisory board around broadband deployment, which is supposed to be a cross-section of um, of the American public, so companies, but also community groups, local governments. Um, and what happened when we were appointed to that body is Mayor LeCarter was the only local government representative out of a group of 30. And so throughout the process, which lasted, we were on the advisory board for about nine months, um, they, they appointed one other, uh, one or two other local government officials. There were investigative reports by the Center for Public Integrity, multiple news articles. I was asked to testify before Congress uh, on local government representation. And ultimately, um, what happened is that this FCC really, uh, as we've seen, is, is not interested in uh, serving the public in the way that we would want, whether it's rolling back net neutrality restrictions or um, privacy restrictions or uh, even things like E-rate, Lifeline. And so um, we ultimately decided, uh, you know, after talking to the mayor, we decided to step off uh, that advisory board and decided to go back to San Jose and really invest in our local community. And so uh, what we did is we went and we negotiated agreements with all the major telecoms. And we will be what we believe to be the, the largest 5G deployment in the country. We'll have about 4,200 small cells across the city. Um, we are actually uh, retooling our permitting process, so we're getting to market uh, at about 20 to 30 days, so twice as fast as FCC shot clocks. And then um, we decided to take the money that we had left and invest it in our community and create uh, the largest digital inclusion fund in the country. So we will connect and build the digital skills of 50,000 residents in San Jose and aim to close the digital divide in our city in 10 years. So I, I want to let that happen. Sorry. I didn't mean to step on your applause. <laughs> Sorry. Um, to go back very briefly when you said that you were the only uh, municipal representation on the FCC. So who were the rest of the people on that board? And what was their charge? What, were the, what was that panel supposed to be about? It was about, it was a um, broadband deployment advisory mm -hmm. committee. And uh, their charge was around uh, how do you deploy broadband, uh, small cells and 5G quickly, mm -hmm. uh, and specifically looking at um, local government regulations around it. And who else was comprised that panel? It was largely industry representatives. Okay, so, that, so it seems that part of your complaint was not only what they were doing, but the composition of the panel being largely industry representatives. And yet, as you just told us, you went back to San Jose and you began to find a way to work with industry. I'm think, I think you're saying that was an important part of what you did. So wh what principles did you apply in working with industry and what are some of the projects that you got off the ground? Sure, I mean, first is, uh, you know, San Jose is a place where we thrive on technology and our private sector 
companies. So we have about 800 technology companies in the city. And so, you know, we uh, absolutely need to work with, with industry. Um, but we also need to make sure that, you know, I think all of us uh, in this room feel that the pace of technology change is happening really quickly. And, you know, how do we make sure that we're balancing this technology innovations with what's good for, for people? And so that's really um, why we decided uh, to be really thoughtful about, uh, you know, as we charge sort of fair market rates around um, our infrastructure, how do we use that money to then, you know, lift up our entire community? And I really give credit to the leadership of our mayor and our council. We had a unanimous vote on creating the Digital Inclusion Fund. And um, we'll be giving out, it'll, it'll be about a $24 million fund. We're giving out the first million dollars to our community uh, right now. So the application is open. And we're really hoping that that's going to change the dynamic um, around uh, the fact that we live in Silicon Valley, but it's really like two valleys because, for example, um, only about 5% of, of uh, Silicon Valley executives are Latinx, yet we live in a city that's 34% Latinx. And so what that means is that children born in our city, children born in Silicon Valley don't have a pathway to Silicon Valley jobs. Um, we have about 100,000 residents that are not online um, with broadband. 100,000? Yeah. With, so that's like 10% of the city's it's population. It's about 10% of the city's population. It's over half our low-income population. And so um, we really need to do something about this. And, and so uh, that's why we created this fund. So uh, just the fact that half the city's, 10% um, uh, of the city's population is not online. Obviously, those are families. Those schools are requiring kids to be online to do homework now, are they not? Yeah, almost all schools um, in our area require homework online, and, and that's just the reality. And we hear so many stories of kids trying to do their homework on a cell phone because that's all their family can afford. And you literally hear phrases like, well, I tried, but usually I just give up. It's very common. And so that really shouldn't be happening in our community. I mean, it's... Obviously, it's not something that anybody wants happening in any community, but the fact that it's happening in San Jose, the capital of Silicon Valley, s says what to you? It says that something's wrong and that we really need to change the way that we're looking at um, progress. Mm. And, you know, we're having a national conversation about inequality, and Silicon Valley is sort of the canary in the coal, coal mine, I think, uh, for the rest of the country around what's, what can happen. And so um, we feel a very strong obligation that we need to address it in, Sil in Silicon Valley and then, you know, take that to the rest of the country. So your project right now seems to be focused on this inclusion fund. You referred to it a few times. So, so what is it? What, what is, what's its scope? What's its size? What's its purpose? And what has unfolded with it? Yeah, it's um, giving out one to two million dollars a year for 10 years. Uh, to community organizations or nonprofits or public agencies to close the digital divide around um, digital literacy, so a lot of coding camps or digital skills or connecting seniors, as well as uh, service connectivity and devices, as well as educating our population around um, why it's important to get on, online. And this is the culmination, really, of three years of research. So we were very methodical about this. So we went out and did street surveys, we worked with Stanford University to get really robust data. As you know, um, the data that's available around the digital divide is not very good. And so, you know, we went out and surveyed uh, over 600 low-income families to really understand access and use in the city around uh, the internet. And then um, we also did, you know, really robust analysis around the broadband market. So if, if you found yourself not satisfied, you and the mayor found yourselves not satisfied with the performance and the commitment of the companies when you were on the FCC panel, now that you're back in San Jose concentrating there, are you finding that the private firms are in any way more cooperative or working in a way that's more conducive to your goals? Are, are you having to crack a whip over them? Are you having to use you know, incentives for them? Uh, so how does that interaction happen now that you're back focusing in San Jose? You know, the reality is private businesses are there to make a profit and to move their business along quickly. And so you really need to, when you're 
partnering with private companies understand their incentives. And in the case of telecommunications firms, uh, it's really around deploying uh, their networks very quickly. And so that's why I mentioned earlier in the conversation that we're actually deploying the networks twice as fast as what the FCC recommends. So um, really, we're going to have uh, close to 1,000 small cells deployed by the end of this year. And then the second thing is testing new technology and services. So telecommunications firms right now are really interested in IoT devices, especially as we move to 5G. And so um, we, we do have, as part of our um, agreements with them, to take about $4 million in in-kind IoT services that help them prove out their business case. Uh -huh. And so if you're meeting those, those needs, you know, we're, we're being good partners to them, they're being good partners to us. And so uh, it's been a really um, good thing, I think, for both sides. And we actually have um, some of those firms that we're working with on the advisory board to our Digital Inclusion Fund. And, and, and are you satisfied with their way they're cooperating? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to go to audience questions in just a couple of moments. So all you would need to do is raise your hand. And um, I believe in this room we'll have a microphone brought to you. It's in the back. But um, before we do that, I just want to very briefly touch on the issue of 5G, because you've mentioned that that's the, the, the thrust of, um, of, of, the, of the improvisation, uh, sorry, the innovation that you're working on right now. Um, Talk about just the challenges of 5G. Is it, is it an especially challenging uh, in, uh, step forward to take? Or, or do you have it all in hand? Is it absolutely critical, by the way, for the, for the outcomes that you want, which is, for example, um, you know, bridging the digital divide? So 5G is, uh, I think, you know, everyone in this room who works in cities probably realizes this, but a lot of times the general public might not realize that it's a massive construction project. The density of small cells, uh, as well as the fiber that's required to get to the small cells, means that um, you are actually doing a, a massive construction project in your city. And so that part um, is a challenge. It does require streamlining your permitting process and, and figuring out to, how to deploy quickly. Uh, 5G is um, hyped quite a bit, mm -hmm. I'd say, in the media. Uh, I think it is uh, a technology that will be very useful in unlocking innovations around IoT, you know, eventually autonomous vehicles, but today it's really more just video and sort of an incremental benefit. Um, and I think that in terms of the digital divide, if we don't address the digital divide now, 5G can actually deepen a, the digital divide because it's going to be more expensive. It requires special kinds of smartphones that people won't be able to necessarily afford. And so uh, I think now is the time to address this issue. So 5G could, if not handled well, could make things worse from the point of view of the digital divide. Yes. Any questions that we'd like to go to? Right uh, here. Thanks. Hi, Stefan Guidouin from the City of Montreal. Um, I wanted to know if in the discussion with the telecommunicators, if you try to have a deal in terms of accessing 5G for public safety, for example. So again, the fact that you give access to the infrastructure have in return a kind of low cost or zero cost access to 5G to have a private network or something like that that allows you to support the police department and so on. Sure. So um, first of all, just to clarify, uh, right now the small cells that we've deployed are 4G LTE. We will have AT&T come in early next year to upgrade them all to 5G. So um, just want to make that clarification point. On the idea of uh, public safety issues, um, one of the things that the city, the city of San Jose is being very careful about is around privacy. And so we are in the midst of uh, writing privacy policies for the city. We've just released privacy principles. So things like you know, cameras, we're not uh, yet deploying them from a, a public safety standpoint until we have our privacy policy in place. What we do have is are things like earthquake sensors, uh, dynamic lighting um, for parks, so that uh, it's safer that way, but not so much on the camera use. There's one, there's one down in the front row, or do you have one? I'm sorry, you go ahead. Sorry. Hi, uh, Brian Dillard, Chief Innovation Officer for the City of San Antonio. Um, so we're currently doing a digital divide assessment, and thanks, Shereen, for being a great example, and San Jose for being a great example. Is there anything after the assessment, and we're doing it with UTSA, who I just happen to have our, my our liaison sitting next to me today, coincidentally. Um, is there anything that you 
identified or didn't identify from that assessment that you wish you would have added into the assessment process? And also, how are you continuing to assess as you uh, go through your, or expend your uh, digital inclusion fund? I think um, the, one of the pieces that is interesting is around public Wi-Fi. And so we had some questions on public Wi-Fi, but separately we have a public Wi-Fi initiative. And what we found, we worked with the largest school district um, in San Jose, uh, 22,000 students, one of the largest in California. Um, when we put up that free public Wi-Fi network, we had like 6,000 families get on immediately. And so uh, how public Wi-Fi fits into your overall strategy is a question I would add. Um, the other thing is just make sure that you're working, it sounds like you already are working with someone who can really bring that academic rigor so you can defend that num the numbers. Hi, uh, yeah, Phil Swan from Greater Manchester in the UK. Um, you don't want to get locked into an individual telco, uh, so, but you don't at the same time want your, your poles for your small cells to be looking like hedgehogs covered in lots of different weird bits of technology. How are you, how are you managing that balance so that you've got a, 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 you know, a level of vendor neutrality? So a few ways. One is um, we are legal, legally obligated to be competitively neutral, which means we have to work with, with everyone and offer them the same sort of deals. Uh, two is design standards up front. So design standards uh, help on both sides um, really streamline the process. Uh, and then three is we actually have our very smart GIS team created a self-service uh, poll reservation system. So we don't have folks competing for the same polls and people understand you know, where the equipment's gonna be. Another question? Shreen, will you, you'll be, a, you'll be a, at the rest of the conference, you'll be available to chat with people. Okay, the reason I say that is I think one of the values of these sorts of sessions is people get to know you and what you can contribute and that the real conversation can take place there. And the reason I'm saying that is because we're out of time. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. everybody. Next, for a conversation about surveillance in cities, please welcome Theo Blackwell, Chief Digital Officer for the City of London, Beth Blower, Executive Director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Government Excellence, and Brian Hoffer, Chair and Executive Director of Secure Justice. To lead the conversation, please welcome back Jean Meserve. So a lot of talk already at this conference about smart cities, which of course involves the collection of a lot of different kinds of data. It improves efficiency for everything from trash collection to traffic, but it's raising a lot of ethical concerns about what's being collected, who's keeping it, how long they're keeping it. If you wonder why, think about Beijing, think about Hong Kong. So we're gonna discuss this today. First, I wanna talk about London. Theo is our London representative here. I understand that Beijing is the only city on the planet that has more surveillance cameras than London. Is that right? How many are there? In London? Yeah. I, I, I have no idea, but there is a lot. certainly, there, there, there are a lot. I mean, London ha does have a kind of tradition of using quite a lot of security cameras. I think that probably goes back to its uh, sort of uh, recent history around terrorism. Also, I think, um, there's a very strong push around community safety uh, about two decades ago in London and indeed Manchester, looking at my colleague Phil here, CDO from Manchester, um, where um, a lot of cameras were put in place in housing estates and railway stations in order to crack down on crime and support a civil inju injunction called an antisocial behaviour order. And effectively, people on the street eyes in the sky, if you like, on CCTV, would identify individuals causing alarm, harassment, or distress, and effectively ban them from an area. And that was really well uh, supported by the local community. I was a councillor at the time in the London Borough of Camden and in King's Cross, which was not a very nice place to be uh, or live. And the support that I think that network gave to clear up um, a lot of troubles in communities, especially around drugs and prostitution, was 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 backed. But so th so there's there's a kind of history here. I mean, I think you're right to point out that we're now moving into a new era of sensors and 
um, how we can identify, you know, greater sort of knowledge about what's going on. And of course, cameras, it's turned from CCTV into a discussion in places around facial recognition technology. Right, and the police in London, I understand, have been doing some... Yeah, they've, they've had a trial, as have the police in uh, Wales. What were they looking for and what did they find? Well, I think they were, they were piloting the use of facial recognition technology to assess its effectiveness. Um, there was a court challenge over it to say whether it should be done at all. The courts decided that it was, in fact, legal and proportionate to use this. And uh, effectively, this was sponsored by the government. Now, one of the things that we did in London, the mayor of London, you know, had a look at this, is the sort of civilian authority on top of the police force, uh, called MOPAC, um, introduced an ethics panel. And that uh, oversaw the police's engagement with facial recognition technology and recommended that there should be national legislation on it. And I think the interesting point about some of these technologies is they're existing in cities outside of national legislation. So cities are kind of slightly sort of copping the flack for a lot of these arguments, whereas legislators don't seem to be fully doing their job um, setting down the rules of engagement around this. And I want to talk more about that before sure. I do. What exactly were the police trying to assess? I mean, how were they using the live facial recognition? And did they get the results they expected to get? Do you know? I, I mean, I think the, the, the sort of jury's still out on, the, uh, on how it was used, but it's essentially to identify people who, um, you know, shouldn't have, as I say, shouldn't have been in an, in a, in an area. Um, so, um, you know, there, there are a number of assessments done around it, um, you know, w worthwhile that it was done rather than introduced wholesale. But I think I would retreat back to the point that effectively to, to do it, you need to learn the lessons and it needs to be a national government decision because we're talking about the deprivation of someone's liberty. And that seems to me a whole scale different order of things. That... Yeah, Brian, I, I want to bring you in here because although we've heard the use case here, it, you know, in its early stages, the cameras actually helped uh, with crime prevention. Um, you have advocated successfully for bans in a number of different cities, including San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley. What's your argument? Why should these be banned? And is it a permanent ban? Uh, a lot of what I just heard made my uh, American ears burn. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> well, tell us why. <laughs> I mean, one, I, I reject the premise that they solve crime. Uh, mass surveillance has almost no impact on, on our crime rates. It may, you know, move it down the block. It may displace it, but it doesn't really uh, solve crime. Uh, London had some of their largest terrorist attacks after all this uh, ubiquitous CCTV camera networks were But installed. I do remember that they were able to find the transit bombers because yeah. of footage they pulled off those cameras. Right, and that's true. Uh, we have seven surveillance vetting ordinances in the greater Bay Area in California. And for the first time with San Francisco, we drew a line and said, this one particular technology is creepier than others. And that's uh, the facial recognition. And that's facial recognition. And part of the reason is the cameras are already everywhere. All you really need to do is flip the switch to have a, a citywide mass surveillance system. Um, as, as we know throughout history, certain communities are always subject to surveillance at different rates than others. Uh, we have a problem with police and race relations here in the country. Uh, in Oakland, my city is about to go into its 17th year of federal monitoring uh, due to racial profiling concerns. Uh, we haven't been able to comply with the court order for 17 consecutive years. So uh, when you see these concerns, and you also realize how versatile facial recognition is, um, the argument, which I always hear when we're lobbying, is that, oh, we just want to use it you know, post hoc, maybe just on video, or we're not going to go to real time because we know it doesn't work right now. But mission creep is reality. Technology always spreads. Any time it could be used in more than one way, it will. And so that uh, varied nature is what we're mostly concerned about. Beth, is there a way to reconcile these two points of view? Oh, I don't think so. No. <laughs> I think, you know, 
I, I often will hearken back to the importance of governance and what we really struggle with in a lot of US cities is not having strong governance around data. Um, Europe is very fortunate uh, that they have a framework that they can lean on um, that really does sort of have de facto protections for privacy and uh, you know that's missing in this country. Um, and so it's the onus is on local government to essentially establish those protections. And so if we can leverage governance in real ways that that can you know, even be shared across jurisdictions, um, then we can think even about testing um, or about um, uh, investing. But you know, there are also other considerations outside of public safety that you have to be really careful about. Um, you know, we talk about social cohesion in communities as being one of the most important mechanisms for advancing the mission of city. And if people are afraid to occupy public space because of over surveillance, or if there is a um, if there is some kind of perception um, that the technology is going to be really disruptive for the ability for them to connect as neighbors, to connect in their communities, I think that has a much longer term disproportionate effect in our ability to drive change in many other areas, whether it's public health, whether it's getting children connected to um, physical activity, um, getting you know the elderly to age in place. These types of um, mechanisms that often are accompanied by misinformation prompt a lot of times a chilling effect in those uh, uh, real strong abilities to bring in social. And this would seem to be a time to point out that these these facial recognition algorithms have been uh, accused at least of being biased, that they are less accurate when it comes to, for instance, African American faces or female faces. Right than they are with white men. But the right. I mean, I think, I think there's also a big challenge here. I mean, I mean, the sort of discussion so far is sort of like, you know, in public space owned by the city, which has its own accountability mechanism and is sort of democratic, there are the use of things where for the prevention of crime and legitimate purposes, and we can have a discussion about, you know, the intensity of that and the rights and wrongs. But, you know, in London over the next uh, 30 years, there are going to be 40 areas that are about to be built from the Royal Docks to Old Oak Common, which is near uh, uh, Paddington Station, like big areas of London are going to be built. These are going to be built by private developers. They will be public private land. And so the question for the city is, what are the rules do we do we put down on sensors and facial recognition technology or cameras in those public private areas? So we're looking at how we can use our planning powers that govern development. You know, we can set affordable housing targets and all sorts of other rules, but we want to develop guidance for uh, those developers on the use of that technology, including, I should say, the security of that data, because a lot of these sensors will be put in place and we don't want it to be hacked or to prevent, pre present a risk to the city. So the creation of standards, I think, is where the debate is at the city level. And we see through our, each city has their own suite of powers. We see planning powers as the way to open up that debate. I'd also like to see, because of the GDPR, people have to produce data protection impact assessments uh, on uh, technologies that they put into place. We need them written or advertised in plain English. We need them collected in one place. For example, our London data store could be a place where we require people to publish those impact assessments. And they can be geolocated so citizens can actually see what's going on around them. So there are ways in which the city can make this much more transparent in the absence of that discussion at a national level that I think needs to happen. Would that satisfy you, Brian? So that's, it's pretty close to the model that we have in the Bay Area. Um, we work under the ACLU CCOPS, Community Control Over Policing Surveillance. We've since modified it so that it extends to data sharing arrangements with private entities. And the calculation that we have to make and that the Privacy Commission that I chair, it's the same calculation the City Council has to make uh, as we advise them, is that the benefits outweigh the concerns. And so that impact statement needs to be done. Um, to get back to sort of something uh, Theo said at, at his introduction, it, it's, it's putting that technology out into the wild before that's done is, is the most concerning to me. That, that we don't have that mindfulness component, we just release it out into the wild and that's sort of the tech mentality. It's like, you know, let's just collect all the data, whereas the legal ethical side is should we in the first place. Yeah. Well, actually, you raise a point. 
Google, Facebook, all the apps on our phone, they're already collecting all this data. Is it different when government's collecting it? Beth? Well, first, I think that people are not, don't even really appreciate what is being collected, and a lot of that is about awareness and is there a role for government to actually do a little bit of that capacity building so that they are going into communities and explaining what is sort of being traded in terms of, you know, there's a really terrific exercise going on in the hallway. I implore you all to go and exchange your uh, personal information for a nice cookie. Um, but the, the reality of the situation is people, I don't think, really understand that what they're giving up. Um, and but when government asks for it, it is more of an affront because I think of the history that government has played in the relationship with people. And so is there room for improvement in this area? I think yes, definitely. But I think it's all it's about raising the ability for the public to have a full sale overhaul in their competency around how data is used and what data as an asset really does mean. I also think that as we start to think more and more about surveillance technology, we need to look at public information requests and the laws that, that regulate those requests and, and really think hard about what does that mean that if we're going to start collecting this data, does that mean that anyone then has the right to come in and extract that data and have a relationship? And we value this relationship we have with the public. They can ask for information. We share that information. But as we get closer and closer to the ground on surveillance, that's going to become a real problem. So London's grappling with some of these issues. Do you find that cities here in the United States, Beth, are actually getting down to the brass tacks of asking the questions that you've just posed? I think no. I mean, I think that that's the risk. And that we it's not just about are they asking them, but do we have um, leaders that know how to ask the right questions? And I think that a lot of the work that uh, we do with the Bloomberg Harvard City Innovation Program and what we're doing in What Work Cities is really just that capacity building, which is like, you got to ask these questions. These frameworks need to be in place. We need to make sure that we have the right protections. And a little bit of that is just first getting the house in order and then also thinking about the broader public um, implications of that work. So people think about Beijing. They think about what's happening in Hong Kong where facial recognition um, is, is being used to identify protesters. Um, is the level of concern about this appropriate to the issue or not? Are we overly worried? Are we not worried enough? You would argue, I imagine, we're not worried enough. Well, you know, we have, we have present day circumstances, we have history. Um, the Holocaust numbers would not have been achieved without IBM. <coughs> they helped automate the destruction of millions of people. Uh, today, we're seeing, uh, you know, Thomson Reuters and Palantir and these other large data brokers that are feeding ICE, which is going out and targeting communities, certainly sanctuary cities in California specifically targeting them. So this data that was collected for a, you know, benign consumer uh, purpose is being used for something that it wasn't intended for and it's being used to harm people. And those people are not going to be looking like me. Any other thoughts on this? I mean, I think... Um, you know, the Europe is in a, in a slightly different situation because of GDPR. Um, and I think, and I, I think we were discussing this just before, and I think GDPR is the beginning, not the end, of the discussion around privacy. But it allows us to have that basic framework of discussion around transparency and rights. And we need to take that forward as cities. And so we've joined with a range of other cities, New York, Amsterdam, Barcelona, where we've come together for this uh, group called the Cities Coalition for Digital Rights, which emphasizes our collective desire to work together on things like algorithmic transparency, AI, 5G, um, issues that we're discussing today, so that we can come to a common framework uh, on top of uh, some of those, um, uh, the, the impact of, of GDPR. But just because we've got laws in Europe doesn't mean that they've necessarily been followed or applied. These are still early days. And certainly we've seen some public agencies struggle with the new legislation. So we need to make sure that obviously we are supporting organizations in their updated approach to information governments uh, and data sharing. But beyond the law, I think it's really, really important that we have political leaders that are able to express why we are collecting data 
Um, I think it's uh, you know really important that cities are able to mobilize data for civic benefits, not just for big tech companies to make money from. You know, we can use it to solve air quality problems. We can solve it, use it to solve violent crime, to make people healthier. But we need to be explicit about the purpose. And so above and beyond the law, the ethics of this must dictate that we are explicit about that, that we're identifying, we're telling people that in some instances, yes, we are collecting your personal information. But in most instances, we're just doing pattern analysis. We want to know how many people are going through our tube system at, at the moment in order to ease congestion um, and be very clear about the full extent about why we're using data. So on collect, data collection on Wi-Fi uh, data on Transport for London's network, the tube network, um, we were explicit about the purpose, about reducing congestion, but also using that for advertising purposes not to target individuals in a kind of minority report style way as they go through the tube, but to price our, ad, our digital advertising appropriately to raise money to reinvest in the tube network. Now being open and transparent, even though that discussion might be a little bit uncomfortable, is where we start so we can have an honest conversation about what we do with things for people. I would even say that it's even a step further is that we need leadership to understand what problems they're actually trying to solve with the technology. And I think that that's oftentimes where we end up getting the wrong match of technology to problem solving. And so why is that? Why is that? Yeah. Because I think that um, I, I can't remember what he said, glitz and glam or something in the, in the first session around smart city or the ideal of smart city. But we, we as leaders want to be able to say we live in a smart city or our city is a smart city. But the reality of the situation is, is that in my mind, smart city is code for I've given over critical city infrastructure mm -hmm. to the private sector to deploy technology that I'm then going to be charged lots of money to get my data back, even though I like, have arranged in this great smart city relationship with um, a private sector entity. And so we got to get our leaders in a place where they can advocate in more meaningful ways uh, for not only the right deployment, but understanding what problems they're trying to solve and how data and the collection of that data will help to get to the solution of those problems. And then also how they're going to use that data to improve the lives of all people that are living in cities, uh, not just a few people that are living in those cities. And I think that when we get to that scoping and that problem identification piece, then we have a much more empowered advocate in the government itself. So we, we're, we we're going to get to your yeah. questions in just a moment, by the way. So tee them up. I'm just saying that just on that, we did some polling of Londoners on how they, what they felt about sensor technology and what we found is that the kind of more abstract it was the more uh, uh, about in the environment it was the more people were kind of okay with us collecting data and the more personal it was the more equivocal they were around this but the really interesting thing coming out around trust was kind of what you just alluded to it, it wasn't that the city would be an effective big brother surveying everyone and doing bad, bad things to them in a kind of, you know, maybe China style <laughs> way, uh, as you su suggested. It was that city officials would be kind of bamboozled by evil tech geniuses in the, in the, in the tech firms and cut bad deals for their citizens. And I think that says quite a lot about people's trust in the city to do the right thing and how if we want to use these technologies, we need to build that trust by not big measures and hiving off parts of the city to be really smart, but actually slow steps. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's, it's the shiny gadget syndrome. Everybody wants to say they're the, they're the early adopter. We're, we're obviously very guilty of that in the Bay Area. And the pressure from private industry is relentless. I mean, these guys are getting solicited every day that my new little widget is gonna solve your big problem. We're gonna solve racism, we're gonna solve use of force, we're gonna solve congestion, we're gonna solve trouble. And it's a lot of hype that isn't going anywhere. And I can't tell you the number of contracts I've read where we don't own the data. The city doesn't own the yeah. data. We just yeah. give it away. We don't even think to ask that question. And, and that's where we've, we've I think, successfully, uh, in, in the cities that are operating under our model, we've turned that around so that those questions aren't left to chance. I do find it kind of ironic that California, which is, you know, at the forefront of our tech revolution, is the place where bans have been instituted. 
I think we're finally uh, being honest with ourselves. We know how invasive it is. We know how much data we've collected and, and that there's a healthy enough activist community that's pushed back and said, you know, okay, yeah, we do want the utility from this stuff, but, but we're gonna regulate it. Um, questions? We have one right here, if you can bring a... Oh, go ahead. I didn't see you right back there. Go hey, ahead. in the back. Darius Ballinger coming from uh, Chicago. Uh, so a quick question. Um, coming into the panel, so I'm trying to get a deeper understanding of what surveillance looks like in cities. Um, I think there was one notion that talked about civic trust. Um, and so one question is, like, how are we building uh, trust within communities so that law enforcement and communities could work together to, make, uh, to increase public safety? Um, but that was kind of the thought that I had coming in, but now I'm hearing about like data collection and, and you know how in one instance London wants to uh, extract more data so that it can uh, improve public services. And, and, and so in that vein, why, isn't, why wouldn't that be communicated as just an opportunity for community folks to participate um, in public infrastructure projects from a more opt-in standpoint from versus uh, we're gonna pull all of your data and, and use what we wanna use. Um, it, it, so I, I'm thinking about that because in Chicago, Chicago, we, we, we suffer from gun violence, which, you know, is, is nationally known and internationally known. But earlier this year, I traveled to London and was, uh, uh, became aware of the, the, knife academic, the knife epidemic that was going on in London. And one of the things that stuck out to me was immediately was, wow, because no guns were available, there seemed to be, uh, that wasn't an issue in that even though knife homicides were happening, they were significantly low from the homicides that we see in Chicago, which reached almost 600 a year to whereas last year London had 150. So back to my, my central question, surveillance in city does what? Does it build public trust? to increase public safety, or is it another way to collect data to improve information for big systems? I think it does all of those things. And I think that that's, that's kind of the, the, the risk and the opportunity. So we see, you know, I live in Baltimore, so not unlike Chicago, and you can drive through intersections in the central core of our city and on the western parts of the city, the eastern parts of the city, and in most every intersection, you can see a lot of sensors. There are systems that are measuring your air quality. There are systems that are surveilling whether or not people are running through red lights or speeding, um, looking at traffic, looking, they're, they're looking at your infrastructure, making sure that your system is preserved in appropriate ways. <clears throat> and we've been using these types of technologies for almost now a generation on making sure that um, our infrastructure is in good shape and, and it's signaling whether we need to change lights out or whether we need to do things. Um, but it's increasingly becoming cheaper and easier to deploy in these other ways. So whether they're reading license plates, whether and they can store more information than they used to. And so I think you're exactly right. These are conversations that we should be having with our community. They should understand what exactly is happening people should be taken on a tour of their neighborhood and shown the different ways and the different um, capacities that they have but also they should be entitled to understand how that data can be leveraged also to encourage them to participate more in the design of their public spaces and the way that they interact with their community and it should be part of a community conversation I think certainly and there are really good models for that um so I think just before this panel, we had, we had a discussion around 5G, and I think the kind of, the kind of game changer for the city that um, 5G requires lots of small cells uh, to amplify its signal. It will require access to lots of buildings and assets. The biggest owner of those assets in any city is the city. It's you, the taxpayer. So they will charge rent for um, for the small cells to be put on place. So the city is now involved in that. That, uh, although to a limited extent, lots of these things are happening already, this will massively change the dynamic between the city, mobile phone providers, who never seem to be really fully part of the ethical debate, but actually are really important to it, um, about what the terms of that discussion are. It will enable lots of IoT sensors to be embedded everywhere. And of course, this pre-stage is something that will survey you all the time, which is drones and connected autonomous vehicles, which will 24 seven look at the environment around it to distinguish that you are not an umbrella or a tree or a shadow or a reflection, <laughs> you know, you are in fact you. And so 
these debates that are happening, they almost seem to be driven by, isn't it cool to have a drone or a connected autonomous vehicle, happen almost outside of the wider privacy discussion that we're having today. So our future city, enabled by 5G, puts this at the top of the civic agenda. It's no longer just a technology conversation. It's something for our city leaders to fully uh, lead on. I don't think surveillance ever increases trust. Um, transparency around the use of surveillance does. With the, privacy, the benefit of the Privacy Commission in Oakland, um, we have an annual reporting uh, component to our model. So for every piece of technology that comes through and gets approved for use, every year they have to come back. It's essentially a one-year trial. They have to come back and demonstrate that they followed the privacy policy, that there was some sort of benefit. And uh, over time, uh, hopefully if your you know, use policy is being adhered to, that should uh, increase more trust in police and how they're uh, acting in your community. On the sort of private smart city side, hopefully you're seeing some sort of benefit from the use of that technology. Uh, I'm a big advocate for mandating cost benefit analysis. Uh, I, I think some of this stuff is gonna be overhyped uh, and not lead to what we think it is. And so we need to make sure that we're spending the taxpayers money wisely, uh, but also not you know, infringing more than necessary on civil liberties. And on that note, thank you all. Theo, Brian Bath, appreciate it. Thank you. So again, thank you to Theo, Brian, Beth, and of course, Gene for guiding our conversation. And thank you to all of our speakers today. I'd like to thank General Motors for making today possible. And a special thanks to all of you for joining and participating in this conversation. Please make your way back down to the Waterside Room for our afternoon uh, plenary that begins at 3.30 p.m. sharp. Um, and on your way down, as you heard Beth alluding to, please make sure you visit our special exhibit featuring Please Enable Cookies Bakery. That is just outside the room here on the 12th floor. It's a delicious way to explore cybersecurity, data, and privacy. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of your time here at CityLab. <laughs>